You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. This is game over. Featuring in depth conversations on sci fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. <laughs> Everybody and welcome once again to Geek Fest Rant. My name is Carlos Brown, and today we're going to go into two different directions. First off, we're going to start with the book Cyborg, better known to some of you as the blueprint for the Six Million Dollar Man. If you've ever seen the Six Million Dollar Man, you'll see it was inspired by this book. It's on the credits. What we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the differences between the book. How does it compare? And I'm going to talk a little also about the fact that I had never seen the original TV movie and what's its place in the story of The Six Million Dollar Man. Plus, I'll have a little bonus information regarding a certain action figure toy that I was able to get my hands on having to do with The Six Million Dollar Man. Then I'm going to jump over to Star Wars posters, specifically a record poster, the poster that came with the original Star Wars soundtrack. A poster that I had, I guess I've lost throughout the years somehow, like a lot of my <laughs> older Star Wars stuff. And I was able to uh, re get it somewhat recently. And a little bit of the history of the artist who drew it and how it's so different than just about any other uh, poster that was created for Star Wars. So let's get started with Cyborg versus the Six Million Dollar Man. Latu, Mirada, You must burn the books, Montag. The books have nothing to say. When I was your age, television was called books. You, Mr. Bemis, are a reader. A, a reader? A reader. A reader of books, magazines, periodicals, newspapers. Today I want to talk about a book that I recently read. This is a book I've been kind of chasing for a long time now and just kind of waiting for the right price. The book is called Cyborg by Martin Caden. And for those of you who don't know, this is the book that inspired The Six Million Dollar Man. Now I've done a show about The Six Million Dollar Man a very long time ago. We didn't really go that deep, I think, into the book itself, into you know how this originated. The book is really, really interesting. And the main reason I wanted to read the book was because even though I had watched the show sporadically and I was familiar with the major aspects of The Six Million Dollar Man, for the life of me, I couldn't remember ever being able to recall watching or seeing 
how he became the $6 million man. Now, granted, in the show opening, you always get that montage of, uh, you know, he's a test pilot and something goes wrong and he get, gets hurt and they reconstruct him and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, okay, I get that. I, I understand that. But it always seemed really interesting that, wow, there are all these scenes about him having this accident, but for whatever reason, I could never find like episode one or episode one would always start with him already being the $6 million man. But yeah, you know, again, back then when I watched the show, now, here's where it gets a little wacky. When I watched the show, I believe it must have been back when I was in Uruguay. Again, black and white, translated in Spanish. Episodes come as they may. Obviously, no DVR, no VCR, no way of recording or watching things in order back in the late 70s or mid 70s in this case. Here, I've possibly seen a few syndicated repeats, that sort of thing. But I was never able to watch this show from beginning to end. I was never able to kind of like take the whole thing in one shot. But I did remember certain key episodes, you know, certain key components, you know, of the story. But I figured, you know what, let's start in one place that kind of begins the whole thing. And that is the book. The book, as I said, I I have been chasing this book uh, for a little bit. As you guys know, one of the things I've been doing is collecting through eBay, you know, movie tie-ins and paperbacks. That's how that's why I do my searches. I do. I go to eBay and put movie tie-in or movie paperback or TV paperback, you know, that kind of a search. And then you get a bazillion movie television related suggestions, you know, for stuff like this. And and this was one that's always been like, for some reason, uh, it, again, maybe I wasn't looking that hard, but it, it kind of kept coming up a little expensive. And, you know, when I buy books in that manner, I'm looking for a three, four dollar book, something cheap, something that's a bargain. And every now and then, yes, I will pay a little more for something that I really, really want. But for the most part, most of these books I end up finding are, are very cheap. So I was able to find one at a decent price. I don't know if it cost me five bucks or something like that. And I, I read the book. The book is really, really interesting. It is super, super technical. I've never read a book so technical before where, you know, not only in the procedures of how these test flights are taking place, but all the medical stuff having to do with his recovery and his his surgeries. And then in the missions that he goes on. It's a very technical-minded book, which was different. It's something I've never read like this before. And with me, I'm trying to compare it to the, you know, to the television series. The book basically follows Steve Austin's test flight. He's a he's a military man, which is kind of it's a little different, uh, you know, for the for the show. He's an he's an astronaut, he's a Air Force guy, he's this, he's that, you know, he's he's like the completely perfect rounded person for this sort of thing. And I think he's engaged, he's going to be married soon. And yes, this 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 test flight goes wrong. Something happens where, you know, it's not foul play or anything. It's just a freak natural event, you know, that makes his, his, his ship kind of uh, wobble out of control and he's completely devastated. Uh, the controls are, I mean... Like I said before, the, the way that they describe the, the procedure of how this flight is taking place and all the different switches he's flipping and he's thinking about this and he's concentrating on that and about his experiences. And, it's you know, it's really, really super detailed and, and it's very enjoyable. It's very different. And you kind of get the feeling, you know, off to the side that the government is also running a program about cybernetics and they're kind of waiting for a possible test subject to pop up. That, that could be a, a good match for this. So we meet some characters that will go on to show up in the uh, television show. Well, obviously, Steve Austin is there. Oscar Goldman is there. And Rudy Wells, who becomes his most direct doctor, you know, in the story. Now, granted, in the book, there's another doctor. I believe his name was Killian uh, somewhere in here who is a, a more of a uh, cybernetic expert. Rudy is more of a medical doctor, but he does have uh, some experience. Oscar Goldman is the government guy, but there's another government guy in the mix. Now, one of the things that the, the, the book concentrates on and place a lot of attention to is how the decision is made or how the decision is carried out of, you know, to make him bionic. Obviously, he's out cold. He's practically dead. And, you know, they kind of 
right that line of well he's he's sort of you know more or less has no family and uh he he is kind of you know indirectly property of the united states because he's a soldier he's an astronaut he's a you know that sort of thing so you know they are concerned with his reaction of how he will react to all this but at the same time there is a certain cold element of the government saying let's do it trigger it and it's wells Rudy Wells's uh, responsibility to be able to transition him to see if it's working, to see if he's willing to go along with it. But obviously, they can't do a damn thing until, you know, they they're able to revive him somewhat because he's kind of like in a half induced coma, you know, to keep him from uh, being in so much pain. And I did get a lot of this feeling, you know, of RoboCop. There is a lot of that element while I was reading this book of the, well, will he want to do this? Does he even want to do this? There's an element here also that did transfer to the, the, to, the to one of the movies of um, him uh, trying to kill himself at some point because they're afraid he might try to do that at one point. But little by little, you know, they, they are able to talk him into it, you know, and he's adjusting to it. And he starts to see the differences of, you know, not only what he can recover, but the fact that he can do more than just recover. And that's the, the selling point here as far as being able to get him to go along with this is that, you know, even being able to have prosthetics, regular prosthetics, is, is kind of like not enough. In his particular case, they have to sell him on something more, which is what this project is all about. There's a really uh, gut-wrenching scene where uh, Rudy, I think, has to convince his fiance, Steve's fiance, uh, to kind of abandon him because he knows or he feels that any sort of recovery will be so painful that it will drive her away. It will make him even more in pain than before and it'll just be a gigantic guilt fest of kind of putting up with him you know of the type of recovery that you know he needs but it's 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 a really awkward decision because it's kind of like it goes kind of against most of the things you see about trying to recover from something where you do need that support system you know of somebody familiar somebody like a wife or or, or a parent or, or or a spouse or something like that but here it's kind of like the opposite they, they kind of drive her away on purpose which is I, I think part of the reason is to is so that he does not have any attachments that can kind of claim or make a decision for him in order to have this experiment take place. So it is a little awkward. It seemed a little cold, even though Rudy is always like looking out for him for his best, you know, the best intentions. But it, it kind of felt a little like, wow, this is a little bit of a manipulation thing taking place. So he cannot make, so nobody can make a decision for him. So I would say about maybe uh, half the book or a little over half the book is him recovering, getting adjusted to all these things, the, how the government is reacting to these things. And at a certain point, it becomes obvious that, all right, okay, he can do these things. He's recovering kind of well. You know, he's still having some issues, you know, every now and then he's, you know, the, the entire recovery process is a, is, is, is a process. He, he has a nurse that kind of starts to kind of fall in love with him, but he's, doesn't pay too much attention to her because he's very cold. He's very, you know, this is how he's dealing with it. You know, he's very cold. He's very focused on the, on, on the work, but doesn't really let anybody in, you know, uh, to his feelings, if you will. But sooner or later, you know that there's going to be a, a government thing happening where, you know, it's okay. The, the experiment's working. Now we want him to um, go on a couple of missions because he can do these things that normal people cannot do, regular soldiers cannot do, and that is part of what this is all about. There's not a lot of pushback, I think, as far as the story goes, in terms of him wanting to be independent at some point. He kind of seems to understand that this is what he's going to be doing. I don't get a, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't see him uh, wrestling too much with, with, with what to do now that you can do this. He does have some negative reactions when he does start to kind of warm up to women. I think it's, again, this nurse or a different nurse, they do stumble on a, on a car accident, uh, I think a bus, and he's able to rescue these kids from, from a burning bus or something like that. And one of the little girls he rescues has like screams when he sees, she sees his arm has ripped up and there's like, you know, wires and stuff inside. And that kind of triggers him to all of a sudden he's like, oh my God, you know, like, you know, he's having like a, like the Frankenstein moment, if you will. But it just seems to me that at a certain point, once he's kind of ready to go and once they explain to him what his missions are or is, 
at the point. He's done. He's set. He's 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 a hundred percent at that point. And he the book has him going on two missions. One mission is kind of like an underwater mission. And at this point, it's very James Bondy. You know, there are certain things he can do that uh, don't necessarily carry over to the television show. For example, the eye. He doesn't have that telescopic zoom lens feature that we do see on the TV, on the TV show. Uh, the eye is more uh, of, a, of a hidden camera function that he can have, where he can kind of take pictures with his left eye. He does have the strength that we, you know, we're, we're used to seeing in the show on one arm and his two legs. But the other thing about the book is that they're able to hide and store a lot of other items inside his prosthetics. So, for example, like on his leg, the, the first mission involves like a lot of underwater stuff. Well, he's able to store a... Um, like breathing, uh, extra breathing apparatus, uh, oxygen devices in his leg and stuff like that. And he's got all kinds of gizmos that can kind of pop out. Even out of his finger, he has some tools that he can get and that sort of thing. So it's really, it seems like they're kind of customizing his, his features depending on the mission that he's going to. The second mission he goes to in the book, it's uh, in a uh, Middle Eastern country. He has to uh, uh, recover, he's trying to steal a, a jet fighter. Uh, so the first mission was underwater. He has to go take pictures, I believe, of a nuclear, a hidden nuclear sub facility somewhere in the, uh, in, in the, in the Caribbean, I think, or something like that. And then the second one is in the Middle East and he's got to steal a secret plane, uh, a Russian MiG, I don't know what model. And the mission is him and his partner. They are out there, uh, trying to steal this, 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 this plane. So yeah, there it does turn very Bondy, very James Bondy at some point, you know, where the you know the 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 women are a little bit uh, you know James Bondy kind of women. They're the partner, but they're kind of swooning over him and that kind of a little bit of that, you know. Soup, some of them are super tough women, you know. It's you do get the feeling that you're kind of watching, especially a Roger Moore kind of. Uh, it, it is the '70s, so you you know that's that's I guess that's what it's where it's coming from. The book did inspire three other novels, one of them called Operation Nuke, the other one called High Crystal, and the other one called Cyborg 4. So those are some that I might at some point maybe pick up. Another difference is that, yeah, in the book, he's so cold uh, in the beginning of his recovery. And, and that's something, I grant, granted, you can, you can do that on a book. You can take your time to make him slowly become uh, warmer to everybody else. Uh, in, 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 in the TV show, or in the movies at least, the, 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 the TV movies... Because here's the thing to keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons I never could make that connection of where does this start was because I've never seen, I think I've never seen before, the original TV movies. The way the show was put together was they made a TV movie, it was successful. They made another TV movie, it was successful. They made, another, you know, they made a series of TV movies, and then they were like, all right, this is, this is it, we're doing it, we're doing a TV show. And then they started doing a TV show. And I guess that's the, 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 the model in the past was that... I don't know, uh, sometimes or most times, maybe you just didn't, with, with a high concept show like this, you just didn't throw all the money, you know, into a television series. You first had to kind of feel it out and, you know, kind of like a pilot. And then you, you put out that pilot and see how people react to it. In this case, they were TV movies. So the first TV movie, which I was able to watch online, there's a couple of places. One of them is NBC.com has a lot uh, if not all of the entire run of the Six Million Dollar Man, and you can watch them there. The first TV movie is the one that covers the majority of this book. The other thing that's a little different is that there is a lot more, let's say, violence in terms of more people die in the book when he engages his enemy. You know, these people are dead. He kills uh, quite a number of them, which is something they kind of avoided a little bit on TV, you know, especially when you get to the 80s, the show's already over, but there was this trend to kind of like, this is kind of a kid show, it's a uh, young adult, so we can't really him having, you know, like, you know, massacring people, you have to make it a little more child-friendly, a little less violent, so they did scale back a little bit on that, and yeah, like I said before, the, um, the amount of tools, the amount of things he's got, like, at one point, I think he's got like a dart that he can eject from his arm or something like that, like a like a poison dart or something. Yeah, these are things that never made it to the to, to the television show. It didn't go that far. And I read somewhere that that was one of the things about the TV show was that they didn't, even though it did, they didn't want it to turn into James Bond. They didn't want it to be, you know, 
the show, by the time you get to it, he's basically a secret agent. And it's one of these situations where it's like the secret agent that everybody recognizes is the Bond issue of, yes, he's a, he's, he's all over the place. And I know he got a mustache at one point, which looked horrible as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, it's it's hard to, to kind of balance those two things. Uh, is it more sci-fi? Is it more espionage? Is it sci-fi espionage? You know, uh, to me, the most memorable episodes that kind of come to mind are more of the sci-fi type of episodes. The, the episodes that deal more with other robots or the Bigfoot character. Anything like that is, to me, it's a little more memorable than just another mission to extract some information and, you know... It's like, okay, we can do that, we can do that, all right, fine. This is, like I said, this is going to be something that I'm going to try to explore a little further. I'm I'm trying to see if I can find those other books. I might start watching the show to get a better feel for it or how it went. Because, like I said, I do remember these highlights, but I just don't remember the details, which is kind of cool. And I know they've tried a couple of times to revive the show under the Bionic Woman banner. And then they, uh, I know even within the last five years, I think there have been rumblings of another a movie i think that they said it's the six billion dollar man or something like that i don't know if that's ever going to happen uh that's in development hell as they say but i was pretty happy overall in in terms of even though there are a lot of differences between the the book and the the, the, the tv movie it, it is pretty faithful to the story more or less again robocop kept screaming in my head you know when it comes to uh reading this book i'm, I'm I, there is no way in hell that robocop uh, did not take a lot of cues from this uh, even though i'm sure there's other sources it's right there it's, it's right there in the book the struggles with the individual, the individual having no rights because he's the property of the government or the police or whatever it is that he's the property of. The disconnect with the family that he had at one point or almost had at one point. Him getting used to it, him struggling, you know, with, with these memories and, 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 so, and so forth. So the other thing was that while I'm reading this book, I happened to go to a collector store far from here in St. Augustine. I was visiting, visiting my son and on the pegs, they had from Zika Toys. I don't remember seeing these in the stores, but I know they were out there somewhere. But I didn't pay too much attention to them. Six million dollar man. What should we say here? About four inch long figures. And these came out back in 2013. So not too long ago. Not too long ago. And what I picked up was Steve Austin in the red tracksuit and... Bionic Bigfoot. <laughs> These are so cool. I mean, the, the packaging is so 70s looking. Again, I've talked about this before. These these uh, vintage uh, recreations that they do now. These different companies. Again, another different company I've never heard of. You know, goes into the mix. And, and they were supposed to apparently release. Uh, let's see. The, this, this particular wave is Steve Austin Bigfoot. And then Steve Austin in a blue tracksuit. But then later they were supposed to release Oscar Goldman, Rudy Wells, Barney Hiller, the $7 million man, and Mr. X, Stalin's robot. Okay, that's cool. Well, from what I understand, the second wave never came. I don't think they made enough money on the first wave. But at least I was able to pick up these guys. And they're very iconic because, again... There's such a huge Kenner connection, you know, you know, my Star Wars toy obsession and how Kenner was involved in both of these. And and this is one of those lines uh, of toys, especially the old Six Million Dollar Man figures, the large, you know, talk about the foot long ones that I, I kind of every now and then go around, see if I can find something uh, to see if there's something close to it. You know, again, I'm looking for a, a, a Steve Austin and a, and a Bigfoot, really, you know, or even the robot-looking one with the robot head. And they're still super expensive, hard to find. That's going to be one of these ongoing things. I never owned them. I never did, so it's not like I'm reconstituting these. But they're ones that, after a while, I remember looking, and I'm like, wow, these look really nice, you know, when I came here. And in the meantime, because they cannot, <laughs> because I cannot afford the larger size ones, these are super cool-looking. They're just so nice. And... They're very well made, and they're just such a great representation of these particular characters. I'm really disappointed that they didn't go forward uh, with these lines. You know, they didn't they didn't do that second wave I was just telling you about. But at least you know this kind of kind of puts you back in the mood and in that mindset of watching the show and and being able to have something of a collectible having to do with it. The I could say I would say the book is great. Get the, at least this first book. I have like I said I haven't read the rest of them yet. But get at least the first one because it is such a good 
connection to the origin of the Six Million Dollar Man. And I don't know if there are other people out there who had the same issue that they remember the show, but they just don't remember how it all started. And and that first episode, uh, that first TV movie, gives you that entire you know material. It's all in there for you to enjoy the other two movies continue with you know the progression of the character and and you kind of start to get the feel of how it's going to work the first tv movie also has darren mcgavin as the government connection he's the cold government guy who's telling everybody what to do you know later on in the series you know it becomes oscar goldman they turn it into a different different actor different different character for some reason they went with with uh, garen mcgavin you know he's a good very good actor but it just seems a little weird it's like because i guess we're used to seeing him in some other other things and obviously later on you have the bionic woman that you know the stories merge together and kind of go into separate directions you know with the television show but big recommendations big big recommendation get the book you can still find it on ebay it might take a little bit of time to find a cheap copy but you can get a more expensive copy if you want but you know You'll be able to find it pretty cheap. And these figures. These figures are a little hard to find. That was one of the things when I went to the store. You know, they wanted, I think they wanted like 15 bucks for, for each one. And I was like, oh, man, I don't know if I want to pay 15 bucks. That's like, that's like, that's almost like, it felt like retail price. And, you know, I'm always looking for a bargain. So I tried looking online and I'm like, I went on eBay. I'm Because, you know, you figure eBay, they'll have it. There was like none to be found on eBay. I'm like, what's going on here? Are these that rare that they're not, they're not even being sold on eBay? And then a couple of days later when I came home, I'm looking, you know, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. These came out in 2013. Wow, they're that old. So I'm do, doing a little more research, a little more research. And I'm finding that, yeah, the price, that is the price. That is the retail price. They're, they're, they're a little rare because not, I guess they didn't sell as many. But uh, therefore, there are not a lot out there that people are trying to flip. And the ones that I did see are more of the, the rare ones. The blue tracksuit guy, people, are, they want it like $50, $60 for that or something. Like, no, that's okay. I, I like the red tracksuit. The red tracksuit is what I remember, you know, from the, from the show more than the blue track suit uh, and Bigfoot. I wanted, I needed a Bigfoot because I know I was never going to get my hands on a large size Bigfoot. But again, these are cool little collectibles, you know, if you're into the six million dollar man. What did I teach you? You are the Duke of New York. You're a number one. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Can you dig it? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That spawn of Satan. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> the force will be with you, always. For today's poster of the month, we are going to focus on a Star Wars poster that is not exactly a one sheet, but it is an officially requisitioned poster that was made before Star Wars came out, obviously. You know, for the purpose, I guess, whether it's for additional art, you know, for future projects or future marketing, for future merchandising, or according to some of the articles I've read that this was also part of the possible conceptual posters used to be able to hopefully sell the film to a studio in a similar manner in which now, you know, we all are more familiar with Ralph McQuarrie paintings as the basis for what was, you know, shopped around and brought around meetings in order to convince, yeah, I guess, eventually 20th Century Fox to fund this film. The poster that I'm talking about was painted by John Berkey. And you guys, for all we know, might actually have this and you don't even realize it or have forgotten about it because this is the poster that actually came with the original soundtrack of Star Wars. If you look at that two-sided, you know, fold, you know, inside the, uh, the, the record jacket, folded up aside from the records, you had a free poster that was included. Now, this is an unusual poster because... It's a different kind of style than most of the ones you're familiar with. I mean, if you think about the one sheets that are out there, the Jung, the, the Hillenbrand, you know, the, the traditional one sheets having to do with Star Wars, even Struzan, you know, if you think about it, all of the different ones that are out there, this one is a little different because things look just a little odd. 
what the poster depicts, which you, you obviously will see in the in the art that I'll include here, is the attack on the Death Star. But the attack on the Death Star and the battle that's taking place, it's really not taking place in the trench like it does in the movie or around the surface. It is basically taking place in orbit. And what you see in at least half of the poster is the Death Star itself. Now, the Death Star looks very, very different than it does in Star Wars. This Death Star, to me, resembles a lot more the conceptual model that uh, Colin Campbell had made of the Death Star with much, much, much more detail and structures and uh, just you could see cross sections everywhere, you know, very, very super detailed surface as opposed to the Finnish model, which was kind of smooth, you know, granted, the closer you get to it, the more detail you see, you know, obviously, but it kind of looks almost like the second Death Star in terms of, you know, how that second Death Star from Return of the Jedi, especially on the sections that have not yet been built and you see the guts of the Death Star and all those cross beams and pipes and tubes. That's what this one kind of looks like. The whole entire surface is like pipes and tubes and cross sections and all kinds of stuff like that. So that's one thing that's a little different. Now, crisscrossing all over the place obviously you have you can see some stars around the edges and you actually even see some planets in the bottom like a large i don't know a moon or a planet or something but it's kind of in the background but crisscrossing everywhere on this painting you have x-wings y-wings tie fighters and a millennium falcons and yes you did hear me right millennium falcons for some weird reason which I haven't really, really been able to find <laughs> why. This artist chose to multiply the amount of falcons like all over the place. Like there is, let me see, one, two, three, four, maybe five or more Millennium Falcons flying around in this poster. Don't understand why. The X-Wings look pretty true to what they look like in the movie. The Falcon looks pretty true to what it looks like in the movie. The Y-Wings look pretty true, a little more, I would say, arrow-shaped heads than the final product, maybe, I would say. And the TIE Fighters really look really good and very accurate if you're looking at them from the front. Now, what's bizarre is that on some of the drawings, you see them sideways, and the actual wing is like a rectangle instead of a hexagon, which is kind of, kind of bizarre, because... You know, the, the changes that are different in this painting don't really coincide, at least as far as I can tell, with any specific period where we might have been in a conceptual drawing stage. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, for example, the Millennium Falcon it looks like the Millennium Falcon. It doesn't look like an earlier version of the Falcon, like the Space 1999 Falcon, the Rebel Blockade Falcon. No, no, no. This is the regular roundish you know, the Mandibles Falcon. So right off the bat, you can kind of say, okay, well, this isn't a first concept. This is somewhere along the way. So he must have had some kind of reference because it's it's really pretty accurate w what it looks like. More or less, I would say, because if you look at the top, it almost looks like there's a cylindrical section in the top where the top gun of the Falcon would be that just looks a little different. And especially when you try to identify some of the other ones in the picture, you know, when they try to do different angles of it, it looks like these different sections just are not what the final product looks like. So it's really difficult to kind of say, you know, how was it that he came up with these versions of these models? Was he shown a picture? Was he shown something? Was it described to him? Was it a drawing? Was it a photograph of a model? You know, who knows? The Y-Wing, for example, looks very, very accurate. And it also looks very, very much like the final design of the Y-Wing, not the earlier Colin Cantwell models, uh, and even, even Ralph McQuarrie paintings, the earlier, earlier ones, where it had the little bubble top, the glass bubble on the top, that sort of thing, with, with the dual pilot station. No, this one, it looks pretty close to what the final version was. The X-Wings look good. The engines, to me, look a little bigger than normal, a little fatter, chunkier, but eh, I'm just nitpicky here. There's a section in the middle, right, kind of like dead middle in the poster, more or less, where it looks like a couple of ships are exploding. And the middle ship, 
I would say must be an X-Wing just because of the color, because it has a red stripe going through it. But it's really hard to tell if it is an X-Wing exploding or some other ship that we can't even, I couldn't even describe to you. It's really, really odd. But by far the, the, the weirdest thing is the, the, the profile of the TIE Fighter. Because the front view of the TIE Fighter is dead, dead, dead on perfect. It's just perfect. You know, it, it, the, the, the way that uh, the height of the wings, the cockpit, the struts that connect between the wing and the cockpit, all that looks pretty close, pretty accurate. But on the shots where you see the side of the TIE Fighter... And the reason why it, it kind of sticks out so much is also if you look at the ones that are coming towards you, the ones that are pretty straight on more or less, when you try to look at the pattern inside the wing, that six section pattern that forms the hexagon more or less, you only kind of see two sections on top and maybe two in the bottom. So it's like, wait a minute, something looks a little off. So then when you actually do look at some of the other smaller ones that are painted in here, where you do get a profile, it's a big old rectangle. So it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Are you telling me that he was never told that the wings are hexagons instead of rectangles? Again, that's kind of odd. I, I do not think that an artist would be given that much leeway in terms of being able to mess with the structures, with already pre-established structures. Again, unless you're doing something in a conceptual stage. If this is conceptual drawings, then yeah, the artist is more or less allowed to go a little crazy with it. Which is why it's so hard to kind of pinpoint, you know, exactly, exactly when some of these drawings, especially this particular poster I'm talking about, was made. Some of the information I found out there refer to him being contracted way, way early on to help promote the backing of the film, which would tell me that there would be nothing at that stage. What's really, really interesting is that in some of the interviews that he's quoted, he talks about how he's not a big fan of, I guess, science fiction and that sort of thing. Ironically, one of the paintings that apparently inspired, or I guess is referenced many, many times uh, that he did is about a spaceship, a rocket ship looking ship, flying kind of upside down on the, passing this very, very structurally mechanical planet looking thing, which looks a heck of a lot, a heck of a lot like a Death Star model. And it's not because this is one of his original paintings. This could also be one of the paintings that Lucas kind of enjoyed and liked. And that's why he contracted this particular artist to come and, and, and do some work for him. Again, the, the similarities are, are incredible between that painting and, for example, the Ralph McQuarrie Y-Wing painting of the Y-Wing kind of diving into the Death Star and you see the Death Star behind. And I again, the irony is incredible or the coincidence. I don't know what you want to call it. But in Berkey's original painting, the ship is upside down and people have mistakenly many times repositioned the picture so that the ship is right side up, but in all reality, it's being displayed wrong. Well, same thing with McQuarrie. He drew one of his pictures of a Y-Wing diving into the Death Star, purposely upside down. And people have made that mistake also in the past. So, yeah, it's kind of weird. It's almost as if, you know, it's conceivable that Lucas saw this painting and said, you know, to, to McQuarrie, okay, for this particular one... I want you to paint, you know, one of our rebel ships diving, and I want you to kind of follow this this inspiration, you know. And it, it, and when you put them side by side, you'd say to yourself, "Yeah, that that that's pretty dead on close." So apparently, this this artist uh, did a number of paintings. None of them, like I said, ended up being the final product of the poster used for the film. However, the two most noticeable ones that you might be familiar with are number one, the one that I'm talking about now, the one that came free with the album, with the two record album. And the other one could have been, because it looks more like, you know, the, that one sheet poster that you would have for the movie. And this is the one where you see Vader in the background and he's holding a fist and very lightly, you could kind of say that he's holding a lightsaber. It's possible he's holding a lightsaber. It's not very clear. What exactly? Because the, the beam of the lightsaber, the blade is it's kind of not very well defined. 
it's not red. So at this point, again, you could say this was such an early concept period that they hadn't finalized some of that. Vader looks pretty close to what Vader finally looked like. You know, like the mask looks pretty accurate. In the background, you have Y-Wings and X-Wings. You don't have, in that particular one, a Falcon. I don't see a Falcon anywhere or a series of Falcons like you do on the record one. You do see the Death Star in the background, but again, the Death Star looks different. It looks very textured. The radar dish portion of the Death Star is just a very slight indentation. It's not the deep dimple that you end up having, you know, with the final version of the Death Star. In the forefront, you also have Luke and Leia. Uh, Luke is, is, is holding, yes, uh, what could be most likely is a lightsaber, but what's funny about it is that you barely see the hilt, you do see the blade, but the blade is very short and it's very pointy, plus it's yellow, which is like, oh my god, here we go again with a yellow lightsaber, is this why, you know, Kenner screwed up with the yellow lightsaber <laughs> all these years ago in the beginning of the toy making process. Did this inspire the, the insanity of the yellow lightsaber? And again, going back to Vader, he is lightsaber doesn't even have a color. It's almost white at one point, And then it, it kind of blends with the blue background. So it's like, I wonder if this has anything to do with this. Uh, you also see Leia. Uh, she's holding a gun. And uh, R2 and C-3PO are off to the side, and to the other side, you got a couple of, a uh, whole bunch of uh, Stormtroopers. The Stormtrooper helmets look a little wonky. They look a little too thick in the bottom. Again, it could be the artist rendition, or it could be whatever they supplied him with to, to, to you know, to paint these drawings. And this particular drawing, like I said, it, this could have been a one sheet. Even what's funny is that even on the top, the very, very top of the painting, there's a lot of empty space, you know, above Vader. There's a, at least, a, I would say, at least I would say a quarter. A quarter of this painting uh, has empty space, uh, which is where you would put Star Wars on it. Well, this poster is finally the one that was eventually, eventually used for the novel. If you guys remember, the I think it was the book club uh, novel of Star Wars that was put out there, uh, which I remember I have it. I had it and I have it. Uh, I had it because I had lost the cover somehow. And uh, I have it because I then repurchased it again uh, not too many years ago uh, with the cover. And the cover of that book, which is that blue kind of book, is that art? They were able to recycle that art, and uh, you know you have you know you have Star Wars on the top, but instead of putting Star Wars all the way on the top with in two lines, they kind of put Star on the right vertically and Wars on the top horizontally. So it's a it's a very unusual way of splitting the logo. It's it's a way that you will probably never see it again, because I would say ninety nine percent of the logo that you will see in, in most merchandising is Star Wars, you know, top and bottom. That's how it works. But again, that secondary picture is probably the second most popular one that you might be familiar with. Now, with that said, he did make a couple of other paintings, drawings, sketches, I don't know what you want to call them. Some of them pretty intricate, some of them pretty simple. There's another one I've seen pictures of uh, the Death Star. And again, a firefight happening, you know, a space battle happening in the atmosphere, you know, off, not so close, but part of the Death Star, I guess, being in flames or, or an explosion taking place. There's other still shots of, you know, again, more X-Wings and, and TIE Fighters fighting along the edge of the Death Star. Really interesting stuff. There's also some other art that eventually got used in one of the DVD versions of Star Wars that was put out uh, a while back, I think it might have been the like the unaltered edition or something, where they take some of these posters or some of these sketches and they incorporate them into the the brochure, you know, the the, the chapter title brochure that comes with the DVD. So they had one for Star Wars for Empire and Jedi. Now, what's interesting is that for Star Wars, you know, it's very clear they're using Star Wars art that that was drawn, you know similar to these posters, the same exact style, that kind of thing. But it wasn't something that was really promoted as a full-blown poster, but they were able to use sections, you know, sections of that. Or either earlier versions, earlier concepts, earlier drafts, if you will. I don't forget, I forget what is the artistic term for a draft, a sketches or, or whatever you call them. Uh, for Empire, 
it's funny because there really is no empire art. I, I believe he was already not involved in empire by the time that art was needed. So for that particular DVD brochure section, you know, uh, pamphlet, they used another Star Wars picture and it, they grabbed a, a picture of Vader, which makes kind of sense because, yeah, it is Vader, you know, it's Vader is the <laughs> very important character in Empire. And, and it's, I remember him being used as part of the logo, you know, some of the merchandising logos, so that makes sense. But then for Jedi, there's actually a Jedi one, which they kind of also split with Star Wars. So once again, Empire used some Star Wars art and Jedi used some Star Wars art and specific Jedi art, which, to the best of my knowledge, came from some Topps Galaxy, Star Wars Galaxy cards that I don't know if he did some Galaxy cards or the Galaxy cards reprinted some stuff that he did, you know, for, for other Star Wars purposes. But what they did is they were able to reuse some of that art from this Return of the Jedi Galaxy card in order to do that third DVD, the Return of the Jedi DVD. What else? He also has apparently done the art for the Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle Parker Brothers video game. Wow. So if you guys remember that one, he also did some work for that. So there will be some art. Now that art looks completely different. Stylistically, it's more realistic. It is very, very different than the conceptual looking stuff that we saw on that other poster. Ironically, the, 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 even the picture of the Death Star, my God, it looks so much more like a modern Death Star because I guess by this point, whether he admits it or not, because I think, in, like I said, in these interviews, he still claims to have never seen the films. It, it is more lifelike and more modern looking. He's an interesting character. He's done some work before. He does have a background, obviously in art, but in poster making. Apparently... Let me give you some of the names of the movies that he has worked on before. Like I said, he's, he's done a lot of other stuff, and some of it is technical sci-fi looking, uh, even though that doesn't seem to be his favorite, according to the interviews, and that's how Lucas was, you know, became familiar with him. But he's done some work, if you guys remember, for Dune. He did a, a European poster for Dune, 1984. The Concord, Airport 79, he did the poster for that. When Worlds Collide. Whew, that's an old one. Orca. Now, here's a poster uh, that's really, really weird. I mean, it's really different kind of style, but it's kind of 70s in a way, if you think about it. Interesting story about Orca. Th again, I don't know how accurate the story is because it sounds bizarre. And maybe it's because the man was older and he's not really telling the story right. But according to the story, he got a phone call from Lucas complaining that the Orca poster was too much like the Jaws poster and that Lucas was suing him and the studio because of it kind of makes no sense because Lucas had nothing to do with Jaws. It was Spielberg. So it's hard to really tell if he was telling the story right or if he or Lucas was maybe calling on behalf of uh, of Spielberg, let's say, because of this lawsuit that was taking place. Uh, I believe the, the lawsuit got nowhere. But yeah, the, that Orca poster is, uh, is really interesting looking. It's really, really interesting. Uh, the Black Stallion. If you guys remember that, Raise the Titanic, Superman 3, Star Trek, the motion picture. This is not the the, the one sheet uh, movie poster. I think this is more of the pre-movie poster, the, the preview poster that it's basically a giant, giant shot of the Enterprise kind of coming towards you more or less in an angle. And in the bottom, you have the pictures of all the cast. So I am familiar with that one. Meteor, if you remember that film, Meteor, The Towering Inferno, another another disaster classic. The Neptune Factor. I don't think I've ever seen that. King Kong. Now, this King Kong poster is the one from the 1976 film. Very, very familiar with that poster. I remember, again, you know, this is one of those cases where the poster is better than the movie. The poster looks a lot better than the movie. Uh, this is the, the shot of, uh, of it's King Kong, and he's got one foot on each of the twin towers he's holding what it might be i guess a train on fire in one hand and and he's holding the girl on the other hand and you cast helicopters buzzing and jet planes buzzing around them and uh i remember i always thought to myself wow that's you know i i i, I don't remember you know that scene in the movie he i don't remember him standing between the two buildings <laughs> but yeah he was uh really responsible for that one Oh my God! Yeah, that's a, that was a good one. Uh, but here's another interesting story: is that he apparently did some work for Universal right after Star Wars, and 
at one point he was not allowed to continue working on either one because this was around the time where Fox, on behalf of Lucas, sued Universal for Battlestar Galactica. So he was doing work with Battlestar Galactica, just like a lot of other Star Wars people, John Dykstra, special effects, even Ralph McQuarrie did some Battlestar Galactica work. Uh, but then the lawsuits happened between those the, those two studios. And then I believe they even said that the studio then countersued Fox because they were saying that the, the droids from Silent Running were copied, you know, in Star Wars. So, again, because of that legal dispute between the studios, he apparently had to kind of stop working for both of them, I guess, until they resolved their issues. So that kind of got him away, you know, from any future or work with Star Wars, which would kind of make sense of why we don't really see him doing anything for Empire. It, it might have been during that preliminary Empire stage where all of a sudden he's not participating in creating all this art like he had done before. So that's that's really, really interesting, you know, that um, that, that he was involved you know, in, in a lot of this stuff. And, and in one of these websites, we even see some pictures uh, of some preliminary uh, Jurassic Park work that he already he had also done. He passed away a, a number of years ago. But it is really, really interesting how, you know, this art still remains out there. And how, you know, we are so used to, you know, when we, when we kind of dig deep you know, into a specific section of Star Wars. And, and, and you know, Macquarie becomes, you know, the, the benchmark for everything having to do with the art, you know. And then you go a little deeper and then you start to find these other names. And then you have another sub-layer of names. And, yeah, it's really interesting, you know. And we talked about this before, how they, you know, they commission work from everybody and they, they pay everybody to, to do some work. You know, a lot of these people don't get paid a ton of money, but everything is kept and they keep everything and they eventually, eventually at some shape or form, they end up using it. And in this, and in this particular case, something that didn't make it all the way to, you know, one sheet infamy or one sheet territory, you know, that kind of thing ends up being part of the marketing, you know, of some major items such as a record or a book, you know, the soundtrack, the official soundtrack. That's a big deal. Uh, the first official novel. You know, by George Lucas. Remember, this was a, this was ghostwritten by Alan Dean Foster, but it, it became that official first novel. And there you go. There's the art. And you're like, wow, this stuff really looks wild. It has a different look. It has a different feel. It doesn't have the Macquarie. It doesn't have any of those other, you know, one sheet poster guys style, you know, an artistic flavor to it. It's a complete different flavor on its own that up to even up to this day, that art keeps showing up here or there i think i have a believe it or not i think i have a tie that uses the art of, of vader holding that lightsaber from uh, from from the novel but i've seen that picture you know in in many other things and again even this uh soundtrack poster you know you might see sections of it recycled and reused in other mediums so if you have the record and you haven't looked at it in a while or maybe you haven't looked at it at all period Take a look, because you might still have this poster, and it, it makes for a great, you know, framed poster to have. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. We started off with a little bit of a revisit to the Six Million Dollar Man. We've done one a very long time ago, but this time we focused on the book, the book that actually inspired the show. It was very interesting to find out, like, the similarities and the differences between the, the two. And also, I'm really happy with those uh, action figures I talked about that I was able to get you know, if I can't have the real thing, I might as well have the next closest thing to it. But then we also talked about our Star Wars poster, the record poster, the Berkey poster. It's a fantastic poster, and it's it's funny because, I, you know, I, I, I still see, like, some people will post pictures of their bedroom, for example, from 1977 or 78, and you'll see that poster. Just like that old Vader poster I was telling you about a few months ago, you'll see this poster also show up in people's walls. But it's right now, it's uh, it's right here in my office as, as one of my rotating posters uh, that I have here. So, on behalf of everybody here, thanks for listening, and we will see you next time here at Geek Fest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. Mission Control, Steve, what is it? What's wrong? 
I was hoping you could tell me. He's alive. He lost an arm, two legs, and one eye. But he's alive. I'm not sure he'd want to live if he can't be the man he was. What if he could be more than the man he was? We have the technology to rebuild him. I want it done no matter what the cost. If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2019. <laughs>